Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk to you about the suicide burn. Now, the suicide burn is the most Kerbal of manoeuvres. It's basically waiting until the very last minute to fire your engines and slow down to a stop. It's kind of like driving towards a parking spot at 100 miles an hour, slamming on the brakes and ending up inside it. Except in this case, the brakes are leaking fluid and will only run for a few seconds. And if you end up outside that parking spot, there's an overzealous cop that will come over and tase you or something. Look, the suicide part of this is because if you are late, you are dead. If you have an engine problem, there is no time to correct it. But even if you're early, that can leave you running out of fuel just above the landing pad and then falling to the ground with great, you know, problems. There's basically not much room for error with those suicide burn. Now the Falcon 9 booster rockets, when they land, they use this type of approach. But for PR reasons, SpaceX prefer to call it the Hover Slam, which is a bit of a lie since a near-empty Falcon 9 actually has too much thrust to hover on even a single engine at minimum thrust. Without the ability to hover, the rocket can only slow down, and if it starts the burn too early, then the rocket could come to a stop while still in the air. And at that point, it either starts getting higher or shuts down the engine and falls onto the pad. Of course, this manoeuvre is popular in Kerbal Space Program uh, because, well, rocket engines in Kerbal Space Program are miraculous. They can throttle smoothly from 0 to 100% power. That is something a real rocket engine cannot do. But in uh, theory, it's the most efficient way of landing a rocket because it's the fastest way of slowing down. And every second spent using engines against the force of gravity is wasting delta V equal to the force of gravity. If you've got the right mods, they can actually do the math for you and tell you when to fire your engines to stop in time. But I'm actually going to show you the math because I'm a sick individual that likes math. So say we have a rocket falling straight down towards the surface with a known thrust to mass ratio then we can figure out the acceleration in the absence of gravity but since the rocket is falling under the force of gravity we simply subtract the acceleration due to gravity and get the net acceleration due to the braking so taking that vessel speed and then dividing it by the net acceleration gives you the time that it takes to reach zero velocity so what we can do is draw a graph of velocity versus time and here's one showing three different landers with different accelerations slowing down from 200 meters per second now the distance each rocket is needing to stop is calculated from the area under the line and that's simply a triangle with the height equal to the starting velocity and the baseline equal to the deceleration time, or a half v squared over a. Of course, you can do this with calculus, but it's easier to illustrate using a graph. So for different base accelerations, you can now figure out the stopping distance from 200 meters per second. And unsurprisingly, this grows rapidly as the thrust drops lower. But more importantly, the lower the acceleration, the longer those engines have to burn against the force of gravity and the more fuel is needed. And one way the Falcon 9 has to increase the thrust is to just use more engines. So some booster landing attempts have been using three engines. So somewhat un unintuitively, using more engines for a landing burn actually means less fuel used to decelerate the rocket to zero. Indeed, the first time I heard about a landing attempt using three engines was the SES-9 launch, which was right at the upper limit of the rocket's capabilities. And that failed so hard that it knocked a hole in the deck of the landing barge. The blast also destroyed the cameras, so the only video we have is from what is presumably considered a safe distance. The downside of those high thrust landings is that the margin for error gets smaller and while we know computers can turn on a rocket at exactly the right moment, it turns out that rocket engines are mechanical devices and they can take a moment to get started and ramp up to thrust and stabilise and it isn't always exactly as predicted. Nevertheless, SpaceX has continued testing and about a week before the Falcon Heavy launch, 
they launched a spacecraft called GovSat on an old Block 3 pre-used booster. And according to Elon Musk, it was testing a high retrothrust landing. It wasn't expected to survive, and they weren't going to risk the drone ship for a booster they planned to throw away anyway. And yet, the booster stuck the landing like a boss, making a soft landing in the Atlantic Ocean. And a few hours later, pictures of the booster floating were also shared. Elon had originally suggested that this booster could be towed home for research purposes. But a few days later, news leaked out that the booster had been scuttled instead, since there was no safe way for recovery crews to depressurize the propellant systems to make it safe. The initial rumours suggested that the US Air Force had tasked a combat aircraft to shoot it, which would have been pretty cool since there's not many aircraft that can claim to have killed a spaceship. The later confirmation was far less romantic, involving a marine demolitions contractor, which still sounds like a pretty cool, if dangerous, job. However, during the Falcon Heavy booster landings we got to see a balanced approach, with the initial deceleration burn lighting a single engine and then bringing three engines online for a few seconds of super high braking, and then the final landing burn using a lower thrust of a single engine. Again, a landing on a single engine is easier because the thrust is lower. So there's some benefits from the increased thrust early on in, in improving the fuel margins, and there's also the benefits of a more controllable landing. However, the third booster out at sea didn't manage to land, since it ran out of the pyrophoric ignition fluid used to light the engines. It had enough fuel, but with only one engine lit, it didn't have enough thrust to slow down in time. Which is kind of a perfect example of why Kerbal players call this manoeuvre a suicide burn. Because if anything goes wrong, there is no time to fix it. That's why the boosters that are heading for a barge landing actually aim for the sea next to the barge until the landing burn starts and everything is going according to plan. Only then does the flight computer skew the trajectory sideways onto the target ship. Of course, all this is oversimplifying many things. I've used a fixed landing speed, whereas in reality when you're falling through a vacuum the velocity will be rising, whereas if you're falling through the atmosphere you might be slowing down due to drag. And that atmospheric drag force needs to be incorporated into the deceleration calculation. Early on the drag will be higher and later on the drag will disappear, so you need to account for that. Also, real rocket engines will simply show variations in their thrust and specific impulse as the air pressure changes. And that air pressure will actually include the dynamic effects of reversing at hundreds of kilometers per hour. Finally, the acceleration of the rocket will just increase over time as fuel mass is burned and the rocket gets lighter. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why things like Flight Engineer and Mech Jeb will get their suicide burn calculations wrong. So even although you're given a number in using these mods in Kerbal Space Program, you still need to act like a pilot and actually adjust the controls as you're descending to make sure you land at exactly the right time. So yeah, despite their scary name, suicide burns are actually a legitimate thing in rocket science that makes complete sense. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.